All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode of the London is Blue podcast. As always, just Brian, Joe, my host, Nick, and Dan. And gentlemen, we got the Brighton match review. Uh, tough one this Saturday, obviously. Uh, so I think it's going to be a little bit more of a, an, uh, maybe a, a, an introspection, Dan, maybe a little bit uh, zooming out as well. Uh, road to 40. That's that's what we should uh, change our Twitter Twitter name to. <laughs> Point, points left till 41. <laughs> points we needed till 40, Nick. To, to How many the, weeks? No, I mean, take the two stars off the profile and just put 39 until we take up to 40. We just need one draw, you know? One draw and we're there. Uh, yeah. P- pathetic. So pathetic many stuff. opportunities to get that one point, Nick. I'm, I'm just so excited. Uh, especially when you've got, uh, got two opportunities, <laughs> Newcastle and city to end the season. Uh, but anyways, we will be touching on, um, you know, on how the fact that when we score goals, we still can't win. Uh, so apparently that wasn't the only thing we needed. Uh, and maybe why Chelsea really should be worried about relegation despite not having 40 points, or maybe we should, uh, we'll play around with it a little bit, but as always, we always want to get the temp check from you, the listeners, the lovely people out there. And that is with the three word match reviews, Dan. Uh, you have to really be leaning into this without the Dan of the match. Yeah, I, I don't get many opportunities to talk on this show. So, uh, you know, I just have to find the opportunity where I can. And with those you three match renamed reviews, it the Dan three word match review or some way to like fix yourself in there. Well, no, it's about, branding. It, it's about <laughs> the people. And we're going to start off with Brad with the Seagulls destroy Alliance. Absolutely. Peck to death. Yeah, Mr. Thurman with the, the bums lost and a little of Lebowski reference as well with the gift choice. Excellent. Chelsea 09 with the beatings will continue until morale approves. It's Steve with at the beach mentioning that he was at Cancun. So that yeah. individual, Steve, made the right choice. Well, to done. go on the beach himself rather than watch the players who were there. Seb C, who you might hear later this week, uh, maybe, uh, with Shoot From Range. Galen with the Sadly Not Surprising. And then Drew with the Me Give Up with a Jar Jar Binks reference from The Phantom Menace. Uh, Brandon, is that a reference that you would understand? Big Star Wars fan growing up. Okay, there we go. I'm just glad that we get one reference in there for you that you... I mean, I've stopped, like you know, episode one and kind of like that second trilogy was about it, though. If anything else has happened, like... Nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> Anything else has happened? Yeah, they just decided to stop making money. So uh, I yeah, mean, probably were. not. I'm just saying, I'm I'm disconnected. Like Jar Jar was about the end of it, right? Anakin's turn to darkness. I'm there. Whatever else happened? Oh yeah, there's that uh, that one guy. There's you no. Know? It's basically an entire other uh, whole universe that you have yet to explore. So yeah. Well, I mean, we could pivot the pod to the end of the season if you guys hey, would like to educate me. I say let's do it. Let's Adam really get Driver, some cannon. isn't that his name? Yeah. Yeah, we get yeah, deep into the, the lore of holocrons and everything. Yeah, we, but we don't huh. have to get there right now. All right. Sounds good. I appreciate your guys' patience with me. Uh, I put PL's Ben over. Don't know what the uproar on Twitter was. Like, s- surprised? That's on you. Really <laughs> shouldn't have been. And uh, all of you upset we won't be in the conference league. Are you? Are you really? Anyways, Dan, what about you? I offended some people when I made a reference to Chelsea's season being as bad as John Carter in terms of box office performance, because I call Mm. this Chelsea's officially a box office bust right now in terms of the investment and return so far for Todd Bowley and team. And uh, yeah, people were, people were offended about the John Carter choice. So to you individuals, I'm sorry, just mathematically the worst return on investment currently for any movie in Hollywood within the last, 30 to 40 years. Huh. That doesn't look good. Uh, from what I can see on a quick Google search, 52% of Rotten Tomatoes. Is that where we're at? We're 52%? Well, considering uh, we're on the table, yeah. <laughs> 52% would be generous where we are on the table. Oh, at least people aren't throwing tomatoes at us yet. Nick, what about you? On Brighton's Beach. Ooh, if only. Yeah, if only. <laughs> We we have another month of this bullshit, <laughs> and then we're then we're almost done. So let's go. Interesting. Well, shout out to Mike for joining us up on Patreon. Uh, same thing. Quick reminder: we'd love it if you just give us a five star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, that's right, both, not just one. If you would, uh, we are climbing the ranks uh, very quickly, which is nice because again, that says we're doing better than some of the actual uh, media companies out there. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in 
uh, to the Brighton match. It was this past Saturday, the 15th of April in the Premier League. It might surprise you. It was actually at Stamford Bridge. Uh, scoreline, Chelsea 1, Brighton 2. Gallagher getting us started with a nice little deflected goal, just like we drew it up. But then Danny Welbeck saw him come on. Didn't feel good after the last time we played Brighton. And then it's CISO and CISO with the 69th minute uh, wonder strike. But like, is it anymore? It just kind of seems like it's a normal week for Chelsea. So uh, shout out to Chelsea in the fifth standout for letting us use the highlights. We'll let them run it back. If you haven't downloaded the app now, the only official app from Chelsea FC. Here we go. All right. Uh, the lineup time, Dan. Uh, there's a little bit of confusion. What is this? 4-3-3, 4 3 3 4 2 3 one doesn't really matter. Once you know it's a back three, that's usually the, or the back four, that's usually the biggest thing with Frank. Well, it was Captain Ketha, Kepa Aretha Balaga in between the sticks with Trev Chalaba, Wesley Fafana, Benoit Betiashiel, and Ben Chilwell as your back four. It was Zakaria making an appearance for the first time in who knows how long next to Enzo Fernandez, Mikhailo Mudrik, Connor Gallagher, Christian Pulisic, and Raheem Sterling as your attack. And look, we saw a four-person substitute with Hakim Ziyech, Reese James, Mateo Kovacic, and Joao Felix all coming on in between the 56th and 57th minute, and then Mason Mount coming on in the 74th minute. So it means only Aubameyang, Azpilicueta, Kukurea, and Edouard Mendy were the unused subs. Nick, four subs at the same time almost feels pre-planned to me. Did it to you? Um, I mean, considering the performance, it felt necessary. Uh, you know, I again, it's a bit of an odd number, admittedly, because you want to typically keep one sub just in case there's an injury. So you usually see like two or three at a time, not four. But yeah, I mean, the performances were so difficult that it was it was not hard to see why that happened frankly uh that's that's kind of where i was at yeah and usually you give people an hour so they come on between 60 and 65 so i i was kind of like you i'm like mm, this is frank trying to drastically change the game versus a yeah. hey, you got your 60 minutes of fitness and then you're out uh some of the top line stats are absolutely garbage uh so i don't know if we really want to go through this <clears throat> um Let's see here. Uh, XG, we had a 0.54. That was generous. Uh, to their 2.94. Uh, we had 43% possession, which we clawed back at the end because we were in the 30s for most of the game. Uh, we had eight shots to their 26. We had two on target. They had 10 on target. Uh, they had more shots off target than we had in the entire game. Uh, so, you know, it was a bit of a tough day. Kudos to, to Kepler. He made eight saves, 80% save percentage on the day is is quite a bit but again when you're getting absolutely peppered and rifled uh goals are gonna happen it's just not good enough uh my fun stat at the pub i was talking to craig from discord he was there it was a lovely hangout from him omaha guy there you go nebraska connection uh, go. brighton almost missed as many big chances as we had total shots it just it never got good it was just gross and ugly the whole time um so it, it just was bad 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 all the way around uh That's the a one this is a legitimate world where they could have beat us six one yesterday. Like, be be real about it. Like, they they were doing the us thing where they controlled the whole game and couldn't figure out the end product. But like, a couple of their misses were just crazy. Like that Matoma one where he dribbled through the entire team and then just hit it wide. I was like, that's what we do. That's a that's a that's a Chelsea move. Um, I mean, they they were dominant in every single way yesterday. A hundred percent. One random staff from Adopt the Joe is 12. Brighton attempted 12 shots in the first half at Stamford Bridge, the joint most that Chelsea have faced in the first half of a Premier League home game on record since the 03 04 season. Absolutely peppered. Do you have an MPET shithouse moment of the match? Nope. The opposite uh, was probably just us walking out. I think CFC Daily, they tweeted something like, I don't know, we're like 20, 25 minutes in, or like the longer it stays zero, zero, or whatever it is, like one nothing, like it just feels bad. I'm like, at this point, the way the season's going, when the whistle blows, you just let that tweet fly. Like <laughs> it just the second we step on the pitch, we're like, yeah, well, we'll see. Feeling a little, little cagey today. So I just, it, it is more of the same, Dan. I think, uh, you know, we'll get in the lineup a little bit, but just the way it kind of came out, I think. The, the vibes around the club, who's playing. I know everything is pointed towards Real Madrid, and it was just a very disjointed, ugly, ugly look from this team. Well, when you have photos 
of Todd Bowley engaging with supporters from above who do not look to be the happiest individuals in the world, given the current situation at the club. And maybe, maybe because we don't have video of it, voicing their displeasure for the current situation. There are reports that people had left very early from the match as well. Once they had realized what was going on, maybe to get back and have a, uh, a sad pub, a sad pub pint afterwards. It just is a really, again, it's a compounding issue, right? Like this is not simple interest. This is compound interest. And the problem, it is a compounding problem that does not have an easy solution. I wouldn't be surprised if there is a bit of an awning or something over the owner's box season, because right now they're highly accessible to those fans <laughs> as it stands. Um, all right, well, let's go ahead. Uh, before we run into it, hit the ad break and we get back uh, the fact that even when we score, we can't save us. So thank you to the sponsors and we'll be right back. Right. So uh, Taylor two has first half Chelsea were under assault from the opening of minutes are uh, we are outshot 12 to three, five on target to our one. They had the Brighton with the three big chances. Thank God they missed them all hit the woodwork with Ferguson as well. Uh, four goalkeeper saves uh, felt decent in the first half. It wasn't going well, but it's like we were in it. We got the opening goal. Uh, we were just finding ways to try to try to break through. I think Mudrick broke lines a couple times. I know obviously he was struggling. Um, but the other thing I think about Nick is when was the last time half those players played together? I mean, it, it's part, but not all of the problem, right? It's like the team is so injured and and frankly not fit. And that's that's been the entire theme this season that you've had to throw many combinations of player personnel together to just fill holes like Reese is not able to play three matches in seven days. Right. So you have to fill them with Trev because Aspie's still out with the concussion protocol symptoms and. You know, it would have been a nice day to have Aspi there, but, you know, then that would have presented a whole other slate of problems. Uh, Tiago Silva is not able to to go. Mason Mount's only able to do kind of really short cameos right now. I, If you expected this to go well yesterday, I'd love to understand why. I mean, I, I, they battered us in Deserby's like third or fourth match 4-1, and that was a just a shit show. This was even worse. I mean, yeah, the score line's not worse, but the play on the field was terrible. I mean, I was really glad that Connor took a first time shot and just said, fuck it, we'll see what happens. Because that, you know, it was nice to get a, a little bit of fortune. But yeah, I mean, you you you're you're playing essentially three center backs and a left back. You're playing a midfielder in, in Zakaria who has shown flashes this season, but has been hurt just as much as he's been uh, healthy. He's and, played an hour since January, Phil said on our pod. Yeah, and and you have Mikhail Mudrik, who is short of confidence. Christian Pulisic, short of confidence. Gallagher, positionless. And Raheem Sterling is not a center forward. So, uh, you know... I, <laughs> Just just look at it, man. It's it's not good. Mendy's not healthy enough to even give him a run out. So uh yeah, then then you bring in Ziesh, who Oh that's that second half. Let's, let's get I to guess. second half. But like, yeah, th- I mean it's it's not good. So there you go. That's my detailed analysis of that. So I guess if I'm looking for things that are positive moments to take out of what was the worst of the two halves i would say in terms of how chelsea were able to at least find footing in the the match i i felt like there was a lot of criticism of chalaba's performance and i think you know he did get burned once or twice but i think also when you look at who was burning him i mean matoma has been arguably for those who not even watching Brighton, but those who just picked him up in fantasy Premier League because he was like five, five pounds to start and now has rocketed up. I think he's like five, six or whatever. Um, he has been an exceptional player for club and country and has had a phenomenal run. And like he is someone who 
winning over 50% of his ground duels and has over 50% successful dribbles. Like he is, he's a problem to deal with. And I think in general, and we, we mentioned Seb's through a match review earlier, he has a like 30 or 40 tweet thread talking about Chelsea's challenges throughout the day and kind of highlighting like where he positionally was doing the right thing, either to you know, play him outside or out wide to reduce some of the opportunities he had to cut in or to potentially play him into a two-on-one scenario and he was isolated one-on-one and some of the times where, you know, Enzo or, you know, Wes maybe wasn't in the right position to help him against his difficult assignment. And so I think for me, if I'm looking to one thing to say, hey, this was a good thing, Brandon, I think that that was... That and then maybe like uh, Mudrick's performance with like the two things that if I were like going to take something away from today that showed me, hey, there could still be some value for the remaining minutes of this Premier League season to get a few people some opportunities to gel with players that they might be playing with next season. Well, I mean, that's a bigger conversation for sure. Uh, and I And one I've thought a lot about. Um, but yeah, look, Mitoma has been a seven or an eight on his ratings, you know, going back over a month. I mean, he has been in flying quality player. Yeah. yeah. So like, obviously, but I would say Brighton are an informed team. They are flying. And I think that's what sucks the most, right? Is that we pipped their, their golden boy manager. They didn't even hesitate immediately brought in Deserby, and they are even better now. And you're like, we flip positions like they're in seventh, like trying to push for a European place. They're ahead of Liverpool. They, they are, are they're flying plus 17 goal difference, 14 wins, seven draws, eight losses. And we, you know, we are just barely uh, getting by. I think that sticks the knife in a little bit more in twists, but if you want to talk about players, Dan, I thought, you know, Betty shield struggled at times today. Uh, Chilwell was the most produced. It was like our highest producing player until Reese came on. Um, ironic that you need a right back to solve your attacking problems. I even thought Enzo was flat today. Um, Zakaria was obviously lacking fitness. Um, Gallagher was a bright spot, you know, big time, but to your point, he was a little positionless. He's just everywhere. Uh, Raheem didn't do much Christian and, and Mudrick struggled at times, but what I tweeted out there, I think like into the 60 something minute, we only had 47 passes in the opposition's half. We defended the entire game. And the thing is, when you defend that much, mistakes are going to happen. You're constantly under pressure. Uh, you can't get the ball out of your own half. There's no outlet. There's no release. There's no plan. Um, and that was really the the big problem. And again, I get confused because I'm like, are these a player problem? Is it a tactics problem? It's probably somewhere in the midst of both. But like my expectations are of the, of the team in the Premier League are zero because what do these players have to fight for? What do these players have to 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 do they're over it they've had four different managers this season they know they're probably not going to get relegated uh they still have a champions league game no one everyone's just thinking about not getting hurt going into the end of the summer i think i saw the tweets from someone saying that we didn't like win any tackles or things like this well they don't want to get hurt they there's nothing to play for these guys they're not going to get fine uh, and if they get benched they don't care they've got their agent making calls around europe i i mean just to go back on on Gallagher, who I I do find a lot of value in, but I think he has to be an eight, not a ten. When you're trying to play out of pressure, you need to know where your surrounding options are. Like especially if you receive the ball with your back to the opponent's goal, you need to have a quick one, two, three option to play out. And then that person who receives the ball needs to have a quick one, two, three option to play out and so on and so forth. When you have That's a guy called like a Gallagher, system. Yeah. <laughs> now, hold on. Hold on, buddy. Um, I'm just talking about stringing a couple of passes together here. But I, I think I think the, the broader point about Gallagher when he plays that far up field is, yes, he's good at pressuring, but he's the only one doing it. So it's pointless. Uh and he doesn't because he's not where he's supposed to be as like a, a 10, at least on the chart that we were looking at from Silva score. A lot of passes go wayward. You recycle the ball back into the pressure and then you have to start over again. And that's what I saw a lot yesterday. 
And I don't think Dan Mudrick in the first half showed enough of like the vertical threat, like going over the top to get those sorts of like break press options out. And so uh, anyway, I, yeah, I mean, it was a disaster against the press, frankly. I mean, yeah, to, to the point you made, the, the whole game was not ideal in terms of the performance. And you know, I think there were some comments that Lampard made about the fitness levels of the overall side. I mean, frankly, got outrun in terms of the desire. And I think this is where people take the action and ascribe the emotion to it, where it's like, because you're running more, like that means you want it more. And like, there is some truth to that but there's also like just fitness levels (laughs) that play into that too and like the fitness level of this side due to the you know soft soft tissue issues that we've had and the you know issues of not potentially playing players like the fitness level is all over the place with the the side that we have i think where what i liked from Mudrick, you know, is that he kind of owned a space in this game. I think before you would trying to figure out like where is he going to be, you know, he stayed pretty much from like heat map perspective, really on the left wing, trying to find an opportunity to get in, using pace to get around. It just made me wonder why he didn't get like a 20 to 30 minute cameo against Real Madrid because he clearly can get around people. The fact now that he has a second assist in the Premier League having really not featured and helping to lead the team with the number of assists we have in the Premier League this season as a January signing. uh, Yeah. Like, okay. What are we in the fifth minute? He gets development on a yellow and then we just ignore him for 30 minutes. Like that's just, that's tactics one one from this team. And apparently Naz tweeted that Chilwell was yelling at Mudrick about positioning and spacing when you look at on sofa score, the player's average position, Chilwell is on the wing at half and Mudrick is slightly in front of him in acres of space. But like that's, th- those are little things that again, just like the lack of repetition, the lack of coaching, whatever it is, is like, I was excited. I think we put in the group chat, we're like, great. Veltman on yellow, go at him, go at him, go at him, go at him. He's a problem. And we did the opposite. We like ran away to the other side and just that's didn't the, do it. The same with Kamavinga at midweek. I yeah. mean, you yeah. had him on a yellow, like, yes, Kamavinga, a significantly better footballer than Veltman. Uh, let's not compare the two, but like you had players who can attack him, and you just, you just decided not to. And I think the thing about Mudrik is he's very, very raw. I mean, oh, yeah. we, and we've known this. I think we have been intentionally like not overhyping him on the show because he's obviously one for the future. And I don't want to, be you know a contribution to him getting into his own head or anything like that so we're just kind of taking him at face value right now uh there i saw some really good things from him yesterday obviously his speed is insane once he gets going but he has to be played into the right space and he has to make the right first choice he doesn't those do those two things his speed is meaningless and it's a moot point uh what i also liked from him yesterday is that when he took the ball from the left wing inside obviously this was the case on the on the assist to Chalaba, but he brought the whole fucking Brighton defense with him. He dragged a lot of players out of position. And that is a dangerous weapon to have because especially if you have Chilwell, which we will not have on Tuesday, uh, if you have Chilwell on the left as a huge overlap, Chilwell was in acres of space. Gallagher had acres of space because so many people are focused on him. If he's able to do that more and control the game with his dribbling ability and his driving ability, you know, there's a there's a huge player there, but he is he's insanely raw right now, and I don't. It, it, he's not our savior this season. Is all I'm saying. I we saw some no. good flashes, but it was it was it was an overall good performance for him. To me, it's underlining the point that whomever the next managerial appointment is has talent around them, but needs to be able to coach up the talent in develop because th- there's talent there. There's talent to develop in this Chelsea side. Not everybody, but there are some gems there that can can be unearthed. Um. Well, all right. The second half brought a ton of new people, and when the subs immediately came up, Dan, I was not thrilled. I was a little disappointed in a couple of decisions, but I always caveat, and I think we all do. I don't know fitness. 
there's there might have been some some discussions I already had because again Christian coming off people will say he didn't do anything again let me remind you the team did nothing to give him the opportunity to do anything he did hit the post my point is there's probably a, a better chance that he's here next season even though it's only 50 50 than Ziyech who came on who was an email away from being gone so from why not just let requests away from why not being just gone? let yeah, why not just let Pulisic? He's not going to set ourselves back anymore. But you at least he's he's had little minutes. So look, if it's a fitness thing, fine. Otherwise, Ziyech, if you look at his average positioning, he just stood on Reese's toes the whole game. Like you, you know what his future is here. Felix came on. He attempted seven passes in thirty-five minutes. James came on. Reese James unlocked the team. Like my God, that poor man has to backpack this entire team right now, like get the man some help and then Kovacic. Okay. Whatever. Right. We're probably going to need him at Real Madrid, but we had to throw him on Dan. To me, the subs were just uninspiring. And obviously outside of Reese James, love him. He's the best, but it's like, what are we doing? Why are we putting certain people on that have no future here? Or really he's Felix. We've seen him so many times. We know what we get. We get a lot of flash, a lot of movement, but not the final end product. Let other people out there show. Where's Matawake? Where's Chuck Chuck Wameka? What? Where? Wameka's hurt, but yeah, yeah, fine. Matawake, some other players. Like, Obama. there's no inspiration there. Yeah, I think the Matawake one is super interesting. Again, we'll harken back to the international break and him lighting it up for the U21 England team. Would have been a great platform to build off of. You're not playing. You're not going to put Kukre in. You're probably not putting Asby in. Uh, Aubameyang probably would have been the one other person who is on the sub bench. Um, you know, someone like Loftus Cheek could have been another uh, valuable player in terms of giving you an option for kind of that right wing, right wing back type of space over someone like a Ziyech. You know, you look at Christian's stats for the game. I mean, he had total of 18 touches, uh, six out of seven accurate passes, uh, one cross, uh, zero shots on target, one shot off target, hit the woodwork uh, once. So, I mean, again, no one was really getting into a lot of forward space to put themselves in a position of actually converting something. I would say with the the only sub that maybe was a question, but then we found out, you know, is that Mason is still coming back off this injury. And so you're getting the programmed 25, 30 minutes of play to get him back into what you would consider like true fitness, true match fitness, Nick. And that that's kind of where I I see what Brandon's saying with the ZH one. He's probably an odd one, but it's also like just who's available, who can we choose from? And maybe getting them some minutes to try to put them in the minds of wanting to leave or to finding a suitor or to creating a market for them. If they do anything magical in the last eight to nine matches. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear you. It's, I think Badawick is a, a miss and has been oddly used. Um, I think Obama Yang would have been an interesting option in the second half, especially when you're chasing a game because we just haven't played with a real number nine in the entire year. Um, so if you have them only for Premier League, why don't you use them in the Premier League? I, it doesn't make any sense to me. Sterling is so art, out of form, it hurts to watch. Um, so I, I mean, there, there just aren't great options to go back to here. And once you give up the goal to Welbeck, which is as soft as, as, as toilet paper, man, like it's, you're in trouble. Right, because the team only has one goal in them, if if that in a game. You know, yes, you could hypothetically hold on for another 45 minutes or 47 minutes after that, but it just wasn't really gonna work. And you know, I, I hear your point about Reese, Brandon. I'll, I guess I'll center on this. He's not healthy. Uh his touches were uncharacteristically sloppy and led to the second goal. Um, of course, not all of his fault because the goalkeeper has to do better on those, but it's, it's just bad. And I think I, I don't, 
again, if if you're talking about just like the the series of events that has led us to this point in the season, we are in the darkest timeline. Like he's not fit. Joe Will hasn't been fit. Everyone's been off. Everyone's playing to their worst possible level right now. And we still don't have 40 points at this point in the season. So it's a it's a hell of a day when uh, Keppa has the most attempted passes. He has the most carries. He had one for one take ons. He had the most touches in the team. And I get that a lot of times it can go back to the goalkeeper. They can take two, three touches. We love the stat pad. But I'm telling you, that wasn't it. <laughs> the Captain fact leading that, from the back, leading uh-huh. from the back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely love it. But I mean, Joao Felix seven passes, Mason Mount nine. They're subs. Get it? You know, Dennis Zakaria, a midfielder, Zacharia, whatever, twelve. Um, Enzo had twenty two, and then the rest of them were just defenders, right? Even Mateo Kovacic came in, had thirty one. Reese James twenty seven. It just kind of feels like a lot of players are hiding right now. And I think it goes back to not wanting to get injured. I bet Aubameyang is telling Chelsea, hey, don't really play me. You know, I'm fine with that. No one is stepping up and trying to change the season as I see it, Nick. So my only thing is I think we should set our expectations that no one's going to stick their neck out. We should expect nothing, nothing from the rest of the Premier League season. The season is fine. You could just stop there. Yeah, there's um, one game. There's no, one game. No, there isn't. Uh, uh, hey, I mean, if, that matters. If the unimaginable happens, th- there's life. Especially because the semifinal is harder than the final. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely stop. Just please. It's it's honestly absurd. Okay, so I have a solution. Physically put the guys who don't want to be here, who don't want to give 100% on the fucking beach, tell them, hey, no harm, no foul. You're not playing the rest of the season. Go do whatever you want. Go train independently, whatever. Because there is a staple, as as we will hear from Phil this week, of youth players who will go out there and give just as good of a performance as we saw yesterday uh, without the nonsense of not wanting to get hurt, not wanting to play for the badge, whatever. If that is legitimately the best that we can expect, if that is the level that we are saying is like the minimum viable product in a loss that we're going to accept for the rest of the season, I want to see anyone who's not reaching a 7 out of 10 on the bench, out on the beach, and I want to see a youth player come in and get minutes to the end of the season. That's it. I, I don't, I'm done, man. I am absolutely done watching half hearted performances because of whatever reason and it doesn't even need to be said like i want to see youth players dan come in give their heart for the shirt and for us to start over because this is a clusterfuck it's it's bad well you won't likely see chelsea win premier league two this year considering that they are seven points so, oh, look, I'm, I'm giving available stats you know Bill and again. i talked about it yeah it's a fish it's mathematically done yep <laughs> but you know, you had Mason Burstow, who Premier League two player of the month this past month. He's a forward. He's probably I, we, more. We talked about this just so you know, like you don't have to try to fill that <laughs> gap. I promise you got the whole thing covered in, in that pod, but you're right. Okay. So, hey, listen on Tuesday because Brandon and Phil have you covered on a selection of players from the buffet. There's mm-hmm. a buffet available at Cobham right now that Frank and team could go pick from to put a couple of players in. And I guarantee you the moment that we are mathematically secured from a safety standpoint, which we'll talk about in the next segment, that you you will see a few more of them in this side because that also is kind of what Frank does. I, I mean, maybe I, if I if I were. Uh, if, if Neil Bath had come down and said, hey, London is blue podcast. Give me your thoughts. There's a bunch of you're, assu- you're assuming a lot here. You're assuming you're it's a, assuming a, it's a wild scenario that has never and will never happen. I'm but, just assuming um, Phil's our proxy. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's what I would say, man. Like what what's the what's the harm? Uh, at least at least the atmosphere would be to go cheer on these kids uh, who actually want to play for Chelsea and who actually want to be here. And they are the future of this of this team. The further You get away from the top of the table, the less prize money you get at the end of the season, the less TV revenue you get at the end of the season, the more you have to rely on your academy to come through and make weight. 
And there are going to be a bunch of players who are not fucking here next year. And thank God for that. And they're, they're going to be youth players who get thrown in. Right. And it's going to be a good thing. I I'm, I'm excited for it. Yeah. So I'm going to pause there. Cause I want to pick some of that up about the relegation conversation. Uh, we're going to take a last ad break when we get back. Uh, I'm going to continue on kind of the, the, the conversation about who's designing what this looks like going forward, because current state, it is absolutely shattered in a million pieces. So thank you to the sponsors. We'll bear it back. To that point, Nick, to that point, I bet Neil Bath is saying that. I bet the director of football operations and whatever else he does, I don't even remember his title now. It That is what he's saying. Now, the problem is, who's listening? Is it Vivelle? Is it Win Stanley? Is it Stewart? I think I'm missing one more. There's We have two technical directors, two co-sporting directors. We've got two owners. Apparently, like we have too many cooks in the kitchen. Who is making the decision about what is going on with the future of how we play and who has a future on this team? Because right now, if Ziyech and Zakaria are getting minutes, if Abamyang is still on the bench and he hasn't featured for who knows how long, I I just have concerns about who is who is running the show here at Chelsea. And I understand it's no longer the Marina show and it's a flattened org and i get that but like they could have easily used frank to cut a lot of players put him in another field and say start sorting out your futures this is what we're going to do going forward because this is the vision this is how we want to play that's what i'm worried about dan so the other thing that we didn't touch on is there were photos of the ownership walking into and being in the locker room slash dressing room after the match reportedly up to an hour after the end of the game on Saturday. So it feels like there's something I would say externally, it would be helpful and it would likely go very, very far to at least not completely comfort because I think there is a, the comfort doesn't ex- won't exist until Chelsea are into next season and we get to hit a reset button. But some type of statement, conversation, external interview talking about, hey, this hasn't gone according to plan for us. We still have a really big vision. Here's our objective between now and the end of the season. Here's what we're working towards. And they can't be frank, which is like this was the problem when the ownership change was happening and the club was, you know, potentially going into administration and Thomas Tuchel had to be the front guy for everything. Mm -hmm. You can't have Frank front this. You need to have someone who is going to be here in the next season, who is a part of the new leadership structure, get on the record externally, Nick, and say something to help us understand as supporters, like what happens next? Because with, with not saying anything, they are basically making it very difficult to support the action or inaction. Yeah. I mean, yes, they need to do a a better job with PR. Um, And I don't, you know, this is not a a shot across the bow of whoever's running PR for Chelsea, but I think just in general, the messaging needs to be better. Although I do feel for them, right? Like, Todd Bowley, Bali, Feliciano, Hansberg Wies, whoever, all these guys, right, who bought the club. All they can do is try and impact change off the pitch. Like Todd Bowley was sat there yesterday taking shit from a bunch of players, a bunch of players, a bunch of uh, fans, sorry, and and watching shit from the players. Um, and I think credit to him, like we've we've seen him interact with fans in a pretty authentic way this year at times, and it's been a hard year. I I noticed a tone change yesterday that really surprised me in a season that I've been surprised and let down a bunch, just like everyone else, where even friends of the show were like, oh, this is all on Todd Bowley. This is Todd Bowley's fault, blah, 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 right? Yes, there are some critical decisions that I think if you had revisionist history on, you might have done differently. And of course, you know, as as the owners and CEOs of the company, right? Like in in my in my world, the shit rolls uphill. So they're dealing with a lot of that. But 
I think there's also been a lot of really good change that's happened this year. The play on the field just hasn't reflected that at all. Like the, the additions that have come in haven't reflected that necessarily. And so that tone, I would just caution people to maybe give it a little more than this calamitous season to place blame at the owner's feet um, fully. Um, I think there's a lot of external factors that that go into that. And I just wouldn't be so quick on that front to make that call quite yet. I mean, I think there's a lot of different moving parts. So I'm saying for sure. Uh, look, they, they have made big bets on the club. They have made big changes immediately for the long-term success. Remember it's a 10 year note clause that they can't sell. So they're not really trying to win slowly over three, four years. They want to set the club up the way they feel they can for immediate success for as long as they can. Uh, obviously this year they've learned a lot of lessons year two is going to be big for them, Nick. And that, in that standpoint, uh, did the changes that they make, the decisions that they make, are they now starting to come together and pay off? And I think that's why we are saying, take your time, find that next manager, de decompress after the season, analyze what went wrong, talk to those technical directors, talk to the sporting directors about what we will do differently. And that manager that comes in needs to be aligned with that versus us aligning to a manager. To me, that's just the number one thing. Well, it's also like they haven't run away from the problem either. Mm -hmm. No, he sat there yesterday taking a bunch of shit. He's taken a bunch of shit in the media. He's taken a bunch of shit from everybody this year. Yeah, he's not running away from it. He's walking down full and Broadway, just like everyone else after the game. Like. Yeah, that, that's fair. That hasn't that hasn't happened previously. And I and I think that, you know, especially as we were going through the transition last year, like you mentioned, I think rightfully so. Thomas Tuchel was the face of the whole organization last year, not anybody else. Right. And so let's just be a, let's let's give a little bit of great. I, I understand people are pissed off. And if you hear the tone of my voice, you know, I'm one of these people. But I think figuring out how to channel your disappointment is a part of life. And this is one of those times where I would just caution against fully blaming one thing or the other. That's all. And if you hate me for that, okay. Yeah, I think it's pretty, pretty reasonable. Uh, again, Dan, my thing is now they've put in a structure. Uh, that structure needs to deliver for them. Yeah. They're paying a lot of people a lot of money. And uh, in my opinion, it starts right now. But, um, you know, maybe these are last chances for certain players or, you know, what are is We don't know the remit, but man, is fans is tough. I, I guess maybe I'll pose this to you. Uh, a lot of people were... Uh, tweeting us say, ha, told you Lampard sucks. I don't think anyone with a reasonable head on their shoulders was like, oh yeah, Lampard's going to save our season. Here comes Europa League. We just said he was going to unite the fans in the club. He definitely has. That doesn't mean that we're any better on the field. And I think people have confused those two quite aggressively. And now Twitter is actually just one sloppy shit show. Oh, I mean, that's unfortunately that's Twitter in the modern era uh, is, you know, I mean, look, who's had a worse season, Twitter or Chelsea? There's a good poll for you. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Tough uh, year for both. Yeah. Uh, always taking a beating. Um, I think that it is easy to conflate the two ideas that you would have a, a new manager bounce, but nothing has gone well with Chelsea this season. So I think the the hope is for Frank to potentially get a couple of positive points on the resume and to, I think, do a favor for Chelsea who are in turn doing a favor to him. And I, I still think there are people who disagree. Why wouldn't you just let Graham Potter remain until the end of the season? Like that was also untenable. Both of those were bad choices. You were caught in the land of bad choices and you couldn't necessarily, I mean, you, you could in the background, but you couldn't necessarily be conducting interviews with Luis Enrique, Julian Nagelsmann, all of these other candidates while you had the manager in the seat in Graham Potter. Frank gave you the opportunity to be more outward communicating about what you're doing, who you're going after, whether it's one of those two, Emron, others, 
now you can conduct that process and get it done. And I think that was the thing that had to happen before the end of the season, because if Carlo leaves Real Madrid, you lose negotiating power because that is a way more advantageous position for any managerial candidate to go after (laughs) than our spot. And so uh, you you had, you had to do it. You were in the land of bad decisions the, the the situation there, Nick, was like the you have a, a a bad car, like continue to throw money in the bad car, just moving off of it and stop repairing it and make the decision to go to the new car. Like that's what we did. We, we decided to stop throwing, like get out of the problem that you're in. And yes, you have a new problem to deal with, but at least you can you can move on now. Yeah, I mean that, that's just, that's where we are. Yes, it's been a fucked up shit show. Yes, in Todd Bowley's wildest dreams. This was probably not a part of it, uh, owning Chelsea Football Club. It's, you know, I think what I realized the other, you know, yesterday and, and into today is just how long a process it's going to be to get back. And, you know, I think, I think there are some legitimate concerns that, you know, Brandon, to your point, they should address and they should be forthright. Um, obviously, the accounting sheet came out a couple of weeks ago and people freaked out and now they're re freaking out and they're freaking out all the time because of the results and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I go back to, um, you know, I was talking to my buddy Joe about this. I am a realist to my core. Some would call me a negative Nancy, but I just, I can believe what I see and I can see trends, right? I believe that, well, I know that this ownership group is incentivized to win matches. They've invested a fuck ton of money, right? I don't think they're here to lose. Um, I also think that it's been about the roughest go that they could have possibly had. Like the law of averages would tell you that next year is not going to be this bad, right? Next year will be better. It may not be better, better. It may not be good enough for people, but it won't be as calamitous. I mean, just, knock on wood, everybody, the law of averages has to come back in our favor and bounce back a little bit. So, uh, you know, again, I, I could go out and throw my toys on the prime, just like everyone else on Twitter and, and bitch and moan all the time. I've done a little bit of that on the show, just a smidge. Now but you? I, I'm, I'm incentivized to believe that these guys want to do better <laughs> at the end of the day, that we all want to do better. And it's, it may not happen this year. In fact, I'm pretty sure it won't. So, yeah, you know, every, like operation, get to the end of the season, press the reset button, move on. Without a doubt. A lot of people think, uh, you know, I even got some tweets about, uh, we're going to get relegated. We're in a relegation battle. No, we're not. Is, is the season unbelievably bad? Yeah. Are we in the bottom half? Yeah. We're not in a relegation battle. I mean, not yet. A lot of things have to go wildly, not our way to be pulled down there. But if, you know, Dan pulled in 538s um, uh, predictions on the uh, the Premier League season, got a 1% chance of getting relegated. Guys, we have to go from 11th, right, to 18th. So that's a long ways to go down the table. We're at 39 points. Nottingham Forest are at 27. We got to lose 13 points in seven games. Just saying, I don't think this is really a thing. Dan, if you want to walk through high level, some stuff, but I just think that people are using this bad run to freak out even more. And look, if that's your MO and that's how you want to view things, that's fine. But like, if Nick's not talking about a relegation battle, I think that is kind of our litmus test. I mean, Nick is, is actively advocating for reaching 40 points, which we should always reach for maximum points that Chelsea should obtain. So I, I get that. And I mean, s- over the past, like since the start of the Premier League, like 36 points on average is actually the the safety number. That has not always been a truism, but look, Southampton are not going to do it. Let's just be fair. So like, if you're worried about one of these teams, you would be worried about Leicester, Everton, or maybe Forrest, who would would work themselves out of historically bad runs compared to to ours as well like i mean the the high level is like yes statistically and probability wise chelsea could get relegated but you're asking three to four teams who have worse records than chelsea 
to outperform their season average and outperform their last seven matches. And some of them play each other. Some of them play us. And so Southampton getting a maximum of 44, Leicester getting a maximum of 46, Forrest getting a maximum of 48, like just isn't going to happen in, in any type of world. Like if A, Southampton and Forrest play each other. So one of those two teams will not hit their maximum total. Two of them have to go play Arsenal. <laughs> uh, all of them have to play Liverpool still. Uh, Forrest has to play Palace last game of the season. The resurgent Palace who at this point could finish ahead of us in the table under Roy Hodgson. Like that, that is a, that is more realistic than a lot of the other scenarios that sees us going down. And so if you look at it, Nick, I mean, Southampton projected to pick up seven more points right now from where they are, which would put them at 30 Leicester to pick up nine more points from where they are, which would put them at 34 and then Forrest to pick up five more points, which would put them at 32 all beneath our current point total. And that is not assuming that we don't get any singular point between now and the end of the season. I mean, we, we, a couple uh, pods ago went through your, your real chances are born myth and forest to get points. If you can get two draws out of that, you're essentially safe. They have us predicted at 48 points, Nick. Where the fuck are they getting those extra points from? That's nine more points. What are you fucking crazy? <laughs> hey, Nine? Math, math is an exact science, right? It's an art form. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that's actually the case. Um, yeah, they do I mean, have I, City winning it all, which would be hilarious and enjoyable. If only. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, I mean, if City win it all, we end on 48 points. What an end of the season. What a just a <laughs> dream. Look, as long as we pip one of the points away from Arsenal, or get a draw with them and take two off their board. Man. That'd be Damn. like when we did that against Spurs with Eden Hazard. Yeah. <laughs> Just let us dream, Nick. Let us be no, makers. Come I'm, on. No, absolutely not. This is the season to believe me, not to believe in your own bullshit. I am right. You guys are wrong. They can be both. Let's two draws. That's all I want. Yeah. And what is Portland. Arsenal? There you go. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It, we'll, I mean, we'll give up. We'll give up the ones. And this is that team who would show up on that and then absolutely lay eggs uh, the rest of the way. Um, look again, relegation. It ain't there. Uh, you can continue to tweet me. I will continue to ignore you because it just doesn't matter. Uh, no day of the match. Obvious reason. Surprise! <laughs> For the ninth straight week. <laughs> So table, uh, some of the, some of the results from around the league, uh, Nick, what was your favorite and why was it Bournemouth? Oh my God. Just, well, okay. Uh, I, I forget our, our boy's name who scored the, the game winning goal, his first Premier League goal. And what an absolute peach it was. The cut out to the left, the cut back onto the right. The confidence and, to set and, himself up. Dude, an Eric Dyer collapsing right as the ball is going into the net. Oh, oh, what an absolute treat that was. Just a little bit of joy out of your Saturday, Dan. Just a little bit of joy. Yeah, not always great moments to come from that. You had United winning but picking up injuries. You had West Ham and Arsenal drawing, which put City in a position to let the T-1000 Erling Holland continue to put them forward <laughs> to uh, helping the rise of the robots continue. And yeah, I mean, we're, in, we're just in a position where, I don't know, I'm in trying to enjoy the narratives that exist around the league because our narrative isn't the most enjoyable one right now. Tottenham falling out of a European spot in addition to us would be a nice, uh, a nice opportunity to. Aston Villa deserve everything they're getting right now. I think that that's been a fun story to watch. They, they boat race Newcastle. Oh my God. That thing was not even close. Newcastle. No. A little wobbly. Just yeah. a little smidgen wobbly. Le Leeds and Liverpool still play tomorrow. And then Arsenal Southampton midweek, but you had uh crystal palace to Sam that Southampton nil uh, Diego Costa scoring for wolves as they won two nothing over Brentford uh, Everton one Fulham three. Uh, Everton really not looking good for them. Uh, yeah, Tottenham two, Bournemouth three, like we talked about, Man City three, Leicester City one, West Ham two, Arsenal two. So there it is, Arsenal dropping points, Bukayo Saka missing a penalty. 
Uh, and then Nottingham Forest nil, Manchester United two, with again Leeds and Liverpool having yet to play. Um, St. Totteringham's Day is back. So if you don't know, it hasn't happened in like three, four years, but it's when Arsenal finishes above Tottenham in the table. It used to be an annual thing, uh, but Spurs have uh, disrupted that. So Arsenal fans really excited. It's I don't think it's I think it's close. I think all they had to do is draw yesterday and it's there. But uh, again, just the low levels of those two clubs, Arsenal in first on 74, Man City second on 70. Only caveat I'm going to say is Man City have 30 played. Arsenal have 31. So assuming Man City win that game in hand, it's a one point uh, difference between those two. Man United. Hey, oh, yeah. Just the last note, because I'm looking at the table. Uh, we've given Southampton uh, six of their total 23 points. Uh, so without us, what they would can be I say except you're welcome. <laughs> Ugh. United in third on 59, Newcastle fourth on 56. Um, then it goes down to Chelsea in 11, 39. We pretty much just been there, are stuck there. Uh, but if that's the the rock bottom, then it is. We're wedged in. Just leave us there. We probably we, we promise we won't ruin anything else or anybody. Just leave us alone. Southampton in 20th on 23 points. Leicester 19 on 25 points. And Tottenham 18 on 18th place in 27 points. Everton are what? on 27. Leeds 29. Not Tottenham. Forest. Sorry. Nottingham Forest. Um, yes. What do you say? You know, whatever it is. Anyways. Uh, Forest on 27. So are Everton. So um, it's probably like a little bit of a gap. Now you're probably down to like five, maybe six teams down there. Uh, but it's nowhere near the eight or nine that it used to be. Um, but they're going to fight to the end. And the problem is when you play teams down there, they're going to want something a heck of a lot more than this team is. So, uh, I don't know. Look, we, we have Real Madrid, you know, that's, that's the next one. It's the only thing that matters, Dan. It's the only thing that has mattered for a long time, but the way it went with Madrid, uh, unlucky to give up the second, um, we scored a goal, so maybe it's a step in the right direction, but we can't continue to give up 20-some shots a game, especially that Real Madrid team. I don't know what's going to happen, but all we can do is hope and pray for a miracle at this point. Well, that and continue to watch the Chelsea women's team uh, advance to cup finals. FA back, cup. To back. back to back. FA to back. Cup. Yeah. Um, let's, back to uh, back to back to back. The back, yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, Emma Hayes is, uh, uh, continues to be the best manager at Chelsea, uh, every year, just like clockwork. And, uh, yeah, next match for them is against Barcelona. So big, big period for them. Uh, if you'd like to watch a Chelsea football team that frankly does not disappoint in the way that the men's team does, this would be a little bit of a PSA to check them out over the next couple of weeks, because it should be ultimately more rewarding than watching what the Chelsea men's team have done this season. Chelsea men's team does not play for each of the next two weekends. So it can't ruin your day or your oh, weekend. There the you next go. two weekends. So how about that? First of all, second of all, 6 30 AM central kickoff for, for Chelsea Barcelona next Saturday, not ideal, obviously from a timing standpoint, but expecting up to 25, 30,000 at the bridge for Chelsea versus Barcelona Love match that. in the champions Love league. That. It's going to be hard. Get up and support them. Uh, Jesse and Abdullah coming back with a, with a Barcelona preview this week on the blue royalty feed, go over to the, to the blue royalty feed, subscribe, rate review, help those guys get the boost in numbers that they saw Richard or we, we put a couple of their episodes out on the main feed this week, um, to kind of give them a, a nice little bit of prop, but, um, but yeah, they're a, they're a fun team to watch and they score goals and it's magical. Yeah. It's a friendly reminder every now and then that they're still doing the, the Lord's work over there, promoting an absolutely fantastic team. I had a little bit of wobble early in the season, but, you know, absolutely riding high like you'd expect them to. So uh, anyways, a lot of content, uh, Cobham crew, potentially Tinkerman uh, match reviews. There, there's a lot going on still. So I know a lot of you are, are definitely down to the dumps like most of us, but there's still parts to think about. There's still parts to push forward to. So uh, a lot of what Phil and I talked about is a look ahead as well. So that might be a little refreshing to everybody out there. So anyways, thank you for listening again. Five stars reviews. We'd really appreciate it. Great community and discord, but until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.